Now let's engage in a very exciting subject called the art of persuasion. Let me give you some notes to take because I found there's a great deal of difference between presentation and persuasion. When I first got into sales, I became a pretty good presenter. Shof taught me well. I used to hear people say, I've listened to a lot of salesmen, but you've got to be one of the best. I thought, wow, the man has taught me well. Somebody else would say, hey, I've been around. I think I've heard them all, but wow, you've got to be the best. You're one of the greatest salesmen I've ever heard. And I thought, wow, I've learned this stuff pretty quickly. Then one day the awful truth dawned on me. I thought, hey, wait a minute, something's wrong here. If I'm one of the world's all-time great salesmen, how come they ain't buying? It started to dawn on me that I had an additional skill to learn. I got very good at presentation. I had yet to get good at persuasion. There were two great orators of antiquity. One was Demosthenes. He was a Greek. The other was Cicero. Cicero was a Roman. And they were both great speakers. But it was said of Cicero, when he spoke, everybody said, what a great speech. It was said of Demosthenes, when he spoke, everybody said, let us march. And that's the difference between presentation and persuasion. I'm asking you to learn this additional skill. We call you a good persuader if now the results start to follow. If something starts to happen, if people decide, if they actually do something about your presentation, if they do something about your appeal, if something happens, now we know you have truly become what we call a persuader. So let's talk about the art of persuasion and what all it entails. Let me give it to you. Here's number one. Be a good storyteller. If you're involved in a company that deals in numbers and business and products and volume of business, make sure you translate all the business into stories. Sometimes it's easy to say, we did $10 million in business last month. And then we forget the stories that are involved in that 10 million. So here's what I'm asking you to do. Become story conscious as well as figure conscious. How many stories does $10 million represent? And if you're only interested in the numbers and not the stories, you'll be limited in your future skills of communication. Try to translate activity and business and volume and money and numbers into people into people's lives and, and stories and who all is involved in the transactions, okay? Now here's another key. Become your own best storyteller. Learn to tell your own story, whether it's identification, logic, solutions. Be a student of your own life. It's so important to go back over your own life. It's good to review at the end of the day your experiences of the day. We call it learning to reflect. One of the keys of making the past more valuable to invest it in the future is learning how to reflect. And let me give you some good times to reflect. One is at the end of the day. Take a few minutes at the end of the day and go back over your day. Who did you see and who did you meet and who did you talk to and what happened? Why did they say what they said and why did you say what you said? We call it running the tapes again. And if you'll take a few minutes at the end of the day and run the tapes of the day again, that day will take a more important place in your equity future. You'll be able to draw from that day. But if you casually go through the day, and then if you casually miss the opportunity to lock that day into your consciousness, sure enough, at some future time when you could have drawn from that experience, it won't be available. Here's how to lock in your past and make it more of an equity. Number two. Take a few hours at the end of the week to go back over a week. A week is a pretty good chunk of time. The sights and the sounds and the colors and the people and the decisions and the mistakes and the errors and the successes. Just go back and review that week and let that week take a more powerful place in your awareness. A half a day at the end of the month. A month is really a good chunk of time. We wouldn't let a company go by without taking a look at least in 30 days. You can't be casual about taking a look. Somebody says, well, let's let the company go a few years and then we'll take a look. Say, no, you can't wait a few years. That would be too late. You could be so far off track. Now, I'm asking you not to let your life go more than about 30 days without taking a serious look at the numbers and what you've done and what you've said and how you've grown and your experiences so that one more 30-day period takes a stronger place in your life. Take a weekend at the end of the year called Time to Reflect. Why? To make the past more valuable. If you treat it so, experiences can become commodity. 
currency, coin. Now, why try to make the past more valuable? Here's the simple answer, to invest it in the future. Let me offer you this challenge to gather up more of your past and invest it in your future. And part of it is studying your own story, because your own story could be so powerful in identifying and offering answers and solutions. No telling what, if you took a little time, you could uncover that you just haven't talked about for a long time. If you were to dig back, no telling what additional stories and experiences you could reawaken so that when the opportunity came, you could draw from that experience and invest it into that conversation and no telling who you could touch. And without it, it might be a touch you couldn't make and a reach for which you're too short. Stories, your story, other people's stories. What a great way to illustrate fact and ideas and philosophy is to use the stories of life because that's the real stuff of life, the stories of life. All right, here's number two in the art of persuasion. Accurate facts. Accurate facts. We call it dealing in truth. Accuracy is very important. Here's why. It builds credibility. Credibility starts to weaken if you mess with the facts, the truth, the correct numbers. Now, everybody will give you room for what we call an unintentional error in dealing in facts. Now, see if my watch says about 728, but if you were to ask me what time is it, and I was to say it's 730, you would allow me to be a couple of minutes off, right? If I said it was 7.30, but accurately, really, truthfully, it was 7.28, you would give me that error to just quickly say 7.30, right? You would say, you didn't mean to mess up my life, right? <laughs> By leading me astray with this erroneous information that it was 7.30 when really it was only 7.28. Now, there are times and occasions when you may have to be precise, and it may be a life and death matter, who knows? But in generally speaking, people will give you room for making what we call an unintentional error in stating what we call the truth. But beyond a sort of reasonableness of unintentional error to what we call in higher circles, unacceptable. Some people deal in exaggeration and it starts to destroy their credibility. If you're giving testimony in a, in a trial and you're on the witness stand, if they catch you in one lie, Guess what they do with the rest of your testimony? They throw it all away. Why? You have destroyed your credibility. The guy says, well, no, I only lied just that one time. Well, how are we going to believe that? <laughs> all it takes is one to now weaken your whole testimony, right? So here's part of the key in the art of persuasion, dealing in truth. Dealing in fact. Here's what we call true sophistication. A total absence of exaggeration. Why? It's unnecessary to the sophisticated. Here's what we call exaggeration. The childish attempt to make up for lack of self-worth. If you don't feel adequate, more often than not you tend to deal in exaggerations, to make up in numbers what you may lack in character or what you lack in substance, or what you lack in confidence. But if you start building character and confidence, and precision of thinking and decision making, and you have a sense of growing worth and value, you don't mind dealing in absolute truth and accuracy, because that's what counts. Here's the next key, better understated than overstated. I have a book called Seasons of Life and it's got my picture in it. And it isn't the best picture. You know, the book came out about three years ago. I published it myself. Every once in a while, somebody says, Mr. Rohn, this picture of you in this book, Seasons of Life, is not the greatest picture of you. I said, I know, that's why it's in there. So that when I show up, I'll look better than the picture. <laughs> right, a lot of people use these glamour Hollywood shots, right? And when they show up in person, they look a little used around the edges, right? I'd rather have people surprised on the upside than surprised on the disappointing side. If you're working with people, let me give you one of the greatest clues I've learned. When you're working with people, let them find out it was more than you promised and let them find out it was easier than you said. Later, you always want people to be surprised that it's more than you promised and it's easier than you said. 
Key here, learn to trust the truth. If the truth isn't enough, then all you have to do is become stronger yourself in presenting the truth. All right, number one was stories. Number two, accuracy, facts, telling the truth. Sometimes you never know who's going to be around to check the accuracy of your stories. But learn to trust the truth. There's nothing more powerful than the truth. I got an ancient quote for you. Here's what it is. The truth will set you free. That's what sets you free. The truth. Many people are dealing in affirmations, but I'll tell you what sets you free. The truth. The best thing to affirm is the truth. If you're broke, best thing to affirm is I am broke. That's what you put up on the refrigerator. <laughs> it's the truth that sets you free. Right? When you're shaving in the morning, gentlemen, if you're broke, you just put that up there. I'm broke. There's nothing better to set you free than the awesome facts, the truth. So deal in truth. Affirmation without discipline leads to delusion. And the discipline and the accuracy of knowing your situation. You say, well, that's a bit negative. You've got to deal somewhat in negativity. If you've got something fairly wrong with your heart, it looks like you're going to need a major operation. How many x-rays do you want them to take to find out what's really wrong? Somebody says, oh, just take one and see if we catch it. You say, no, no, not my heart. How many x-rays do you want them to take? It's kind of a negative subject, taking x-rays. How many? As many as it takes to find the full extent of the facts called the negative problem. So best to state the truth. Now we can deal with truth. Now we can deal with the problem if we accurately state it and we take an x-ray that shows it in all of its insidiousness. Now we can go after it and we can affect a cure. Now we can start the positive treatment. But at first, you got to know the problem before you can find the answer. So dealing in truth, so important. It sets you free. Next in the list of key things to remember in the art of persuasion. I've got down here quotes. You might as well borrow somebody else's good language if they've said it extremely well and you can use it to illustrate a point. Just borrow it. I borrow everything I can borrow. All the stuff Mr. Shove taught me, I borrow all that. You know, try my best to give him credit for all the things he shared with me. But borrow, borrow. Some people have said it so well, there's no use trying to think up another way to say it. Quotes. It shows you've done your homework. It shows you're passionately interested in your subject. The quotes, the stories. In some other seminars I give, I use a lot of quotes. I'm talking about humans being affected by each other, and I quote the lyrics from a recent song that says, If not for you, the winter would hold no spring. Couldn't hear a robin sing. I just wouldn't have a clue if not for you. Now, see, that's so well said, you couldn't improve much on that. So the key is to just borrow, borrow all that you can borrow to support your argument, to express your heart or to express your mind and your feelings. This is part of the art of persuasion, learning to borrow things well said and well constructed. Winston Churchill said the truth is incontrovertible. Malice may attack it and ignorance may deride it. But in the end, there it is. See, that's so well said and it's so precise. And it's so dramatic that you might as well borrow the drama that comes from the language just by exercising the quote. I talk about the brevity of life in one of my other lectures. The Beatles wrote, life is so short. And for John on the streets of New York, it was extra short. But see, those are powerful words. Elton John sings, she lived her life like a candle in the wind. Wow, you can't think of much better lyrics to describe how fragile life is and how brief it is. Right? Those are unique words and the key is to learn the words and borrow the words and borrow the quotes to support your expressions, your communication, your conversations. Benjamin Disraeli said, nothing can resist a human will that will stake its existence on its purpose. Wow, that's powerful. We call this towering language. We call this climbing the summit of words and sentences and phrases that have incredible meaning. So briefly said and yet so powerfully done. And you might as well borrow the power and borrow the explanation and borrow the effect of somebody else's unique words. Just borrow those and put them into your presentation. You'll see the dramatic difference right away. And think up words of your own that are powerful. But when you need it, reach and borrow.
somebody who has said it well and offer it for somebody to consider, to touch the heart and touch the soul and mend the problem and get somebody to decide, to try, to move, to change, to grow. Of course, this isn't an easy task. It wasn't meant to be easy. It was meant to be a price because that's how you appreciate the promise of language, the language that affects the cure, the language that reaches and touches. You've got to go through some of these skills, learn the craft. Now, I've got another word down here you might not have that much use for. It's called oratory. Oratory is a dramatic way of saying something to catch someone's attention, to drive the point home. But I do have a bit of oratory. One of my lectures, I'm dealing with the problem of complaining. I go through a whole list called the diseases of attitude. And when I get to the last one, complaining, I'm wanting to really make it clear. And I say, spend five minutes complaining and you have wasted five. And you may have begun what's known as economic cancer of the bone. They will soon haul you off into a financial desert and there let you choke on the dust of your own regret. That's what we call a bit of oratory, right? <laughs> oratory. Just a burst, right? Now, you can't do 30 minutes of that, right? That'd be too much. But when the occasion calls for it, oratory. Saying something in a more dramatic fashion. Here's the next one. This is very important in dealing in the art of persuasion. Straight talk. Doesn't almost everybody make the comment, tell it like it is. And that was one of the great experiences I had in meeting this incredible gentleman, Mr. Schoff, when I was 25 years old. Mr. Schoff only went to the eighth grade in school, so he put things in very simple language. He said, Mr. Owen, if you're 25 years old and you're an American male and you've been to high school in one year of college and you're not at least a third of your way towards your fortune, he said, isn't something wrong? Now, see, I'd never looked at it like that before. As being wrong, he said, something's wrong, right? And there's, he said, there's nothing wrong with the country and nothing wrong with the companies and there's nothing wrong with the banks and the money, but there's something wrong with your plan. There's nothing wrong with you, but there's something wrong with your thinking, something wrong with your plan. You bought the wrong story. You bought the wrong formula. And it's easy to wind up a nice person and broke. It's easy to wind up sincere and poor. I'm telling you, you can be sincere and poor and you can work hard and be poor if you buy the wrong formula, buy the wrong plan. You didn't add up the percentages. You never took out the calculator. You never counted the cost, as an ancient phrase says. Now, see, that kind of blunt, straight language really helped to uncover where my problem lies. Let me give you one of the most clear formulas he gave me that helped to change my life. We deal in what we call basics in one of my lectures, basics, fundamentals. And there's just a few fundamentals and there aren't any new fundamentals. You've got to beware of somebody who says, I got a new fundamentals and no fundamentals are old. Here's one of the greatest of basics and fundamentals. It comes from an ancient Bible phrase. Here's what it says. Whatever you sow, you will reap. We call it simply the law of sowing and reaping. Right? Simply put, the law of sowing and reaping. Now then, Mr. Shelf said to me, Mr. Owen, there's another way to quote this law that may very well help to discover where the problem lies. I said, okay, I'm ready. Here's what he said. It's also quoted like this. Whatever you reap is what you've sown. I thought, wow, I never thought about that. Now there went my list of all the things I blamed for my current circumstances. If you don't like the crop, who do you look up? Answer, whoever planted it. And where do you find who planted your crop? Answer, in the mirror. That's where you go come fall, come harvest time. You go to the mirror. And if necessary, you say, a few skinny carrots? I got to be unimpressed. Where were you last spring? Asleep. Didn't you read the books? Did you break your hoe? This is talking straight. This is telling it like it is. I asked the question last night, am I reading enough books or am I not? If I engage in my current financial practices, will it take me toward the fortune I would wish for in the next 10 years or will it not? If I keep up my current health practices, will I have the vitality and the health and the vigor to do all the things I want to do five years from now? Will I or won't I? Are my current practices taking me where I would really like to go or have I been kidding myself for quite some time? I had a day just before I met Mr. Shove called, do not kid myself anymore day. 
Here's where I am after 25 years. Here's what I've got. There's no use Mickey Mousing with the numbers. There's no use trying to stretch it. There's no use trying to excuse it. There's no use trying to paint it some phony color. Let's tell it like it is. Because it's the truth that starts the freedom mechanism working. It's the truth that starts to relieve the mind of all the guilt and all the excuses and get right down to where it is. When I finally discovered that the government wasn't my problem and that prices weren't my problem and that it wasn't the company and it wasn't company policy and it wasn't my negative relatives and it wasn't the weather and it wasn't the economy and it wasn't the community, when I finally discovered it was me, we call that trauma. Now, after I had passed through the trauma of discovering that it was me and not all the other things I'd blamed all those years, when I finally went through the trauma, now suddenly it dawned on me, hey, if it's me, I can do something about that right away. And then I started getting excited after my trauma had passed. The only change that is really going to dramatically affect your life is you. Mr. Shove said to me, Mr. Owen, if it isn't going well for you, you don't say what's wrong out there. You say what's wrong in here. There's a black heritage spiritual that says it's not my mother nor my father. It's not my brother nor my sister. It's me. What a revelation. But once you find out it's you, that's something you can go to work on this very day. You can start to make a new stretch today. You can start reading some new books today. You can sign up for some new classes today. You can start engaging in constructive thinking today. You can make some life-changing decisions today. See, you don't ever have to be the same again after this evening, only by choice. Now, this is called dealing in straight talk. Next, in the art of persuasion, challenge. Challenge. We all respond to a challenge. I don't know a normal human being that doesn't respond to a challenge from the time we were small. How high can you jump? How fast can you run? How much can you do? Can you win? Right? We all respond to a challenge. So part of the art of persuasion is challenge. Here's one of the greatest challenges Mr. Shof gave me. He said, let's go do it. That's the great challenge. Not you go do it. Let's go do it. Boy, it's easy to say you go do it. You go change your life. You go be successful. You go make the decisions. But how much better if somebody comes along and says, let's go do it. Let's read the extra books. Let's make the decisions. Let's pour it on. For the next six months, let's go full speed, 110% and see what comes of that. Boy, what an inspiring thing when somebody says, let's go do it. That's the greatest of challenge. Let's. But life is a challenge. What else is new? It is so important to articulate the challenge, the press, the push, because the push is on. But that's what life is all about, accepting the challenge, driving the roots deep, becoming as strong as possible, accepting everything that comes and making it into what you wish to make it, attempting your best, trying your hardest, thinking well, reading well, living well, struggling with it all. That's called the challenge, but that's what makes life worthwhile. That's where the value is. The struggle for high ideals to make something unique out of your life. I don't know how better to put it. That's it, the challenge. Now here's the last part in the art of persuasion. The word is passion. Passion is the emotion. Unique thing about emotions. Emotions is what gives us the drive. Emotions is the spirit. Emotions is the life. It isn't just knowledge that makes you wealthy. It's knowledge mixed with feelings and attitudes and emotions. The surge of feelings and emotions. But here's the key. Our emotions need to be educated. We've got to send emotions to school. We call civilization the intelligent management of human emotions. You've got to have the drive. Without the power, you don't get anywhere. But now we've got to have the power well-educated and well-directed. But that's what it takes in the final art of persuasion, putting yourself into the picture. Passion, emotion, beliefs, convictions. If you can learn to articulate those well, if you'll learn to let that flow, not just from the surface, but from down deep, from a lifetime of experience, if you'll draw from all of those feelings and commitments and awareness, even with some misgivings, even with not knowing it all, even with a sense of humility, 
But it's that flow of emotion that finally now seals the point in the final art of persuasion. When people have picked up the essence that you really believe and are committed to what you've been talking about, and that's why you laid it on the line. That's why you borrowed every quote you could borrow. That's why you said it as well as you could say it. That's why you told every story you could. That's why you used yourself front and center. It's because you so passionately believe in the moment and what you're trying to accomplish in the way of decision making in touching somebody else's life. Now, how good can you get at all of this, the art of persuasion? Probably one of the best illustrations I can give you is an ancient Bible story. I'm an amateur on the Bible, but there's some neat stories. One is so dramatically told, it bears repeating. It says, King Agrippa was advised one day that he had a famous man in his prison. And they came and said, oh, Agrippa, we have got the man you've been wanting for a long time. We've got him locked up in your dungeon. And King Agrippa knew who the man was. He was the great leader of the early Christians, formerly known as Saul from Tarsus, now known as Paul, apostle, leader of the early Christians. And Agrippa has been brought this incredible news that this man is in his dungeon. I'm sure Agrippa said, you don't mean the man himself. They said, O oh, king, we have got the man. Agrippa evidently had studied this whole Christian movement and had watched it grow. And evidently he knew a lot about the man. And he said, bring him to me. I got to see the man in person. So they hauled him out of the dungeon and stood this man in front of the king. And the king took one look at Paul and said, Paul, I've heard all about you. Unfortunately, you find yourself in my dungeon. But what is going on here? What is this Christian movement? Why are all these people willing to give their lives for this incredible cause? And, willing to sacrifice. It's growing like a prairie fire, spreading like wildfire. He says, what's going on here? What is happening? What is this Christian thing? What about you? And Agrippa said, tell me your story. He shouldn't have asked. <laughs> right? One more time, with eloquence to spare. And if you're a good reader of drama and stories, this is one of the most important ones to read in all of literature and history. He gave the greatest example of somebody who knew how to use the language to tell his story. And he went through and told his story. He said, I used to hate the Christians. I was known as Saul from Tarsus. And then one day I'm making it for Damascus. This great light shines out of heaven, knocks me flat, grinds my face in the dirt and blinds me for three days. He told the story with eloquence and precision and drama. And then he said, I...